Today's story includes several very distressing and at times graphic segments. And also at the end of the story, we show several pictures that on the surface may seem fairly benign, but once you understand their context, they are quite disturbing and haunting. So viewer discretion is advised. On February 12, 1999, 42 Carol Sund, along with her 15-year-old daughter Julie and Julie's longtime friend Sylvina Peloso, who was 16 years old, boarded a plane in Eureka, California. After a quick one-hour long flight, they landed in San Francisco and then got their bags from baggage claim and then walked over to the airport's car rental center. After Carol signed some rental agreement paperwork with the person at the front desk, they were given car keys and then the three women walked out of the airport into the parking lot where they saw their car. It was a 1999 red Pontiac Grand Prix sedan. After the women had put their luggage in the trunk, they all climbed inside, and then Carol began driving east towards the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. Julie was competing in a cheerleading competition the following day at that university, and Julie was considering going to the school after she graduated high school, and so this cheerleading competition was a great excuse for her and her mom to check out the campus, and since Sylvina was already visiting Julie at her home in Eureka, she just tagged along for the trip. After an hour and a half long drive, the trio arrived in Stockton, California, and they checked into a hotel, and then the next day, which was the 13th, Julie competed in this cheerleading competition, and then after Afterwards, her, her mom, and Sylvina spent the rest of the day checking out the campus and the surrounding town. Early the next morning, which was the 14th, the women checked out of their hotel and then drove three hours southeast to the sprawling motel complex called Cedar Lodge that was located just outside of Yosemite National Park's western entrance. Their plan was to spend a couple of days sightseeing inside of Yosemite before heading back to the San Francisco airport where they were going to meet Carol's husband and Julie's father, Jen and then the four of them would continue their journey and fly to Arizona where they would explore the Grand Canyon before finally heading back home to Eureka, California. So midday on the 14th, these three women arrive at the Cedar Lodge and the lot would have been nearly empty because it was the winter time and not that many people were visiting the park at that time. So they pull into the lot, they park their car, they go into the front desk where they checked in and they got their keys and then they left the office and walked along the row of first floor rooms all the way to the very corner of the building to room 509, which was their room. Carol used her key, she opened the door, they went inside and dropped their luggage, and then they decided that they were just too tired to actually go in the park and go sightseeing that day. So instead, they kind of had a low-key afternoon and evening, mostly in their hotel room. The next morning, which was the 15th, the women got up early, they hopped in their red rental car, and they drove to the western entrance of Yosemite. They went inside, they parked their car, and they have this wonderful day looking at these astonishing cliff sides and snow-covered mountains mountains and these huge sequoia trees and these beautiful meadows that stretched out in front of them. And then towards the end of the day, Julie and Sylvina actually went ice skating on a frozen pond. So it was just this totally magical day at the park. And then finally, as the sun was starting to go down, the trio finally left the park, got in their rental car and drove back to the Cedar Lodge. There they ate dinner at the Lodge's 1950 style diner. They ate hamburgers. And then afterwards they swung by the front desk and rented some VHS movie tapes that they brought back to their room. Once they were inside room 509, the women changed into their pajamas and then sat on the bed and watched one of their movies. And then when it was over, they brushed their teeth and then they got in bed, turned out the light and tried to go to sleep. But a few minutes after their lights were out, they heard a knock on their door. The following day, which was the 16th, Jens, Carol's husband and Julie's father, was anxiously waiting at the San Francisco airport for his wife and his daughter and his daughter's friend. And he's looking at his watch and he knows they don't have that much time before their flight is going to take off. And he's just hoping they're gonna come running around a corner and they're gonna barely make this flight. But they don't. And finally, Jens, who does not have a cell phone and neither does Carol, he decides there must have been some sort of miscommunication and that Carol and the girls must have flown on ahead. And so he decides at the last minute to just board the flight himself and fly to Arizona in hopes his family will be there. But when he touches down in Arizona, his family is not there. And so he rushed to the hotel hoping that maybe they were there. They weren't. He spoke to the hotel's front desk and said, hey, you know, has my wife Carol contacted you? And they said, no, she hasn't contacted us and we have no no record of her being here. And so Jens is obviously very upset, he's very worried, and he spends the rest of the day calling around to friends and family and acquaintances and anybody who might know where 
Carol and the girls are, but nobody has heard from them and nobody knows where they are. And so that night, as Jens is about to go to bed, he convinces himself that they are probably just fine. This is just some screw up. Carol is an unbelievably fierce woman. She's incredibly competent. She will take care of those girls and I'm sure I will see them tomorrow morning. But when he woke up the next morning and Carol had not made any contact with the hotel or reached out to him in any way, and there was just no sign of her or the girls, Jens finally contacted police. That day, after the police spoke with Jens, the first call they made was to the Cedar Lodge, which is the last place they knew Carol, Julie, and Sylvina had been. The manager of the lodge would tell police that he had not seen Carol or the girls on the day they were supposed to check out, which was the 16th. But Carol had checked out in advance, so the the manager would not have seen her anyways. She would not have had to go by the front desk on the way out. So that was not an anomaly. The manager also told police that on the 16th, after the three women should have been out of their room, the cleaners went by room 509. And when they went inside, it was vacant and nothing seemed to miss. It was relatively clean, minus some wet towels that had been left on the floor of the bathroom. The keys to the room were left on the desk as they should be. It just looked like the women had left. And so the police reached out to the car rental company at the San Francisco airport to see if Carol had made it to the airport and dropped off her car. But when they spoke to the manager of this rental company, they would say, no, Carol has not dropped off her car and she hasn't called about extending her lease, which is now overdue. Based on the information the police gathered from the lodge and from the rental car company, they began operating on the theory that the three women left their lodge motel room on the 16th and then either got into a car accident somewhere and had just not been found yet, or they had driven somewhere, gotten out of their car and gotten lost, perhaps inside of Yosemite National Park or some other trail somewhere, or they had fallen victim to some crime. But at this point, the police were not taking seriously the idea that foul play was involved. A massive search was launched in and around the Cedar Lodge complex, as well as around the western entrance of Yosemite, but absolutely nothing was found. A number of workers from Cedar Lodge were interviewed by police and subsequently cleared of any wrongdoing. Also, a number of friends and family of the three women were also interviewed by police and cleared as well. Then, a few days after the search had started, there was a break in the case. Carol's wallet, with her ID and credit cards inside of it, was found lying on the ground in Modesto, California, which was a suburb that was located about two hours west of Cedar Lodge. Some high school students saw it on the ground and gave it to a police officer. There was no reason for Carol and the girls to be in Modesto, California, and so this signaled to police that a third party had to have been involved in their disappearance. And so if that was the case, then almost certainly these three women had fallen victim to some sort of crime. Over the next several weeks, police continued to search the roads and trails in and around Cedar Lodge and the western entrance to Yosemite and they looked all over Modesto, but besides this wallet being found, there were no further developments with the case. Then on March 18th, which is about a month after the three women originally went missing, a hiker was way off in the middle of this forest about two hours north of Cedar Lodge and about an hour and a half northeast of Modesto, California, when he turned onto this logging road that nobody really ever went down. And as he's walking down this road, he sees up ahead the skeleton of a car. It looks like a car had been set on fire. And so he calls it into police, not really knowing what he's looking at. The police come out and they're able to identify this car. The shell of a car is the red rental car that Carol and the girls had been using. When they searched the car, the inside, the main cabin of the car, there really was nothing left. There looked to be some remnants of some suitcases and maybe some clothing, but mostly it was just the frame of the car and some springs. But when they opened the trunk of the car, they made a grisly discovery. Inside were two very badly burned bodies with their hands still bound behind their backs. Using dental records, they were able to confirm the bodies belonged to Carol and Sylvina. But there was no sign of Carol's daughter, Julie, the 15-year-old. She was not in the car, around the car, or in the surrounding areas. And so there was this glimmer of hope that maybe if law enforcement acts fast enough, they can find Julie and save her before it's too late. But all hope was lost when just a couple of days into the search around the car, when they still hadn't found anything, the police received an anonymous handwritten letter. And on this letter was this crude map that showed this very specific spot overlooking a lake. It was Don Pedro Lake which was located about an hour to the south of where the car was. And then on this note as well was a phrase. It just said, we had fun with this one. 
Using this crude map, the police went to Don Pedro Lake, they went up to the overlook as marked on this map, and there they looked down and they saw the crumpled and badly decomposed remains of Julie. At this point, police already had several suspects they'd picked up in Modesto, California, that they believed were connected in some way to what happened to these three women. Of these suspects, two were of particular interest to the police. They were half-brothers Eugene Dykes and Michael Larwick. They had been arrested shortly after Carol's wallet had been found for shooting at a Modesto police officer and for several drug charges and for violating their parole. Once these half-brothers were in custody, Eugene made several self-incriminating remarks, basically insinuating that he and Michael had been involved in what happened to these three women. And then after Carol, Sylvina, and Julie's bodies had been found, the synthetic fibers that were found all over Carol matched the synthetic fibers that were pulled off of Michael and Eugene on their clothes and from their vehicle when they were arrested. And so the police were very confident that they had their killers and they had them behind bars already but they still needed to compile evidence before they could formally charge them and make their names public to the media. And so when the news broke about the women's bodies being found and the public began panicking about a killer or killers on the loose, the police came out and said, everybody calm down, we have the people responsible, we just can't tell you who they are yet, you need to be patient, we're building the case, but everybody's safe, there's nothing to worry about. But four months went by and the police still had not come out and publicly charged anyone with these murders, but they continued to assure the public that they had their killers behind bars and so nobody has anything to worry about. On the afternoon of July 22nd, roughly four months after the discovery of the three bodies, Dr. Desmond Kidd, who was the medical director for Yosemite, had just finished a long 24-hour shift in the clinic and he had just gotten back to his cabin, which was inside of Yosemite, when his pager went off. And so he went to a phone, he dialed the number that was on his pager, and the park dispatcher picked up and said, hey, Dr. Kidd, can you be a part of a search for a missing person. And Dr. Kidd said, sure, you know, I'd love to help. And then there was a pause and the park dispatcher said, hey, just so you know, there are law enforcement implications with this one. And then before he could clarify, he hung up the phone. And so Dr. Kidd is really confused what he meant about these implications because in the past three years he had worked at this park, he had unfortunately been involved in many searches for missing people in the park, but they were never tied to any sort of criminal activity. They were always because the person got lost or fell or something, which was fairly common inside of the park. And so as soon as this convoy of other Yosemite staff members that are part of the search rolled up in front of his cabin, Dr. Kidd ran outside, he hopped in one of the vehicles and he asked the driver, you know, what's going on? What are these law enforcement implications with regards to this missing person? And the driver would explain to him that, you know, hey, four months earlier, we had those three Yosemite tourists go missing, Carol, Julie, and Sylvina, and they were found murdered outside of Yosemite. And while the police have said they have their killers behind bars, the police still have not come out and actually named who their killers are or charged anyone in their murders. And so that's made many of us think that maybe they don't have the killer or killers behind bars. Maybe there's a killer or killer still on the loose. And unfortunately, tonight, we have another person who's gone missing inside of the park. And she's gone missing under very mysterious circumstances, which has led many of us to think that it's possible if there really is a killer out there, they've struck again tonight. Dr. Kidd was totally shocked at this news, but he was even more shocked when he discovered who it was that was missing. It was somebody he knew. Her name was Joey Armstrong, and she was a 26-year-old naturalist employed by Yosemite. A naturalist is like an expert tour guide that knows everything about the park. Dr. Kidd and the rest of the convoy of Yosemite staff that were gonna be a part of the search sped around the corner and went down this unmarked road with huge trees on either side, and then eventually they came out of this heavily forested road and they entered into this unbelievably beautiful meadow and on the very far end across this huge meadow is this one green cabin sitting at the base of this mountain with a forest on the other side of it. This totally secluded cabin in the middle of Yosemite was where Joey was living. As Dr. Kidd and the convoy went across this meadow and got closer to this cabin, Dr. Kidd could see park rangers walking around the perimeter of the cabin marking it off with yellow police tape. When Dr. Kidd and his vehicle came 
came to a stop right outside of the marked off area, they got out and they could see parked right next to the cabin was this white pickup truck. It was Joey's pickup truck. And inside of it was a bunch of luggage. And it looked like there was luggage that had spilled out onto the ground and some of the doors were still open. And so it gave Dr. Kidd and the rest of the searchers the impression that Joey must have either been loading things into her truck or unloading things out of her truck at the time she went missing. Dr. Kidd and the rest of the searchers kind of huddled up with the park rangers and the rangers explained that Joey's friends that were living in San Francisco were expecting Joey to arrive at their house the day before, but when she didn't and they couldn't get in touch with her, they had called it in and that's why they were there looking for her. And so after talking about the circumstances of the case, they all decided they would break into five different search groups and they would begin searching the immediate area. Dr. Kidd and four other searchers began walking behind the cabin towards the tree line. And then once they got into that forest, they started walking towards this creek. And as they walked up along this creek, they suddenly noticed a whole bunch of trampled ferns and saplings. And it looked like someone had come running through there. And perhaps the person who was running was Joey. And so they begin following these tracks that go right along Inside this creek and then at some point one of the searchers yells out hey what's that up there and about 10 feet ahead of them where the ground kind of sloped down into a ditch out of view right before the ditch hanging on a little tree on the ground was a set of car keys glinting in the sunlight and so Dr. Kidd, who was at the front of his small search party, he began walking towards these keys. And as he got closer and closer, he began to be able to see down into this ditch right on the other side of these keys. And as soon as he could actually see what was at the bottom, he immediately began to gag and he turned around and quickly walked away. The other four searchers, they walked up and they had a look down and they too had a similar reaction. And before long, the group was running back to the cabin to tell the park rangers what they had just discovered. When the rangers heard about what was in the forest, they immediately contacted the police and the police sent a police officer to Joey Armstrong's mother's house, which was just outside of San Francisco. When the mother opened the door, the officer told her that they had just gotten a call from Yosemite and they need her to call them. And then he handed her a piece of paper with a phone number on it. Joey's mother was immediately concerned and confused and tried to get more information from this officer, but the officer just said, look, you're just going to have to call that phone number. I really don't know anything. And so eventually she thanked him. She shut the door and she went into the kitchen and she dials this number. After someone picked up, she introduced herself as Joey's mother. And at that point, the person who picked up quickly handed the phone off to someone who sounded much more senior. And this person asked Joey's mother, are you aware that your daughter is missing? So Joey's mother says, no, I was not aware of that. And then this person very delicately says, ma'am, we believe we found your daughter's body near her cabin. Joey's mother's reaction was instant. She said, well, did you check her hair? She has red hair. Can you confirm it's really her because she's got bright red hair? Can you make sure it's really her? And the person on the other side of the line hesitated for a minute and then just said, ma'am, we're not sure if she has red hair or not. We'll get back to you. And so after this call finally ended, Joey's mother was confused. How could they not know what color her daughter's hair was. That seems like such an easy way to potentially identify whether or not this was really her daughter. Why would they make her wait for something like that? And so she was horribly distraught. She didn't know what else to do. She was told to just kind of wait for more news, but she couldn't do that. And so she began planning a trip out to Yosemite to actually get out there and see what was going on. But the earliest flight she could possibly get was not until very early the next morning. And so she has this very restless night's sleep where she's just praying that this person was not actually her daughter. And then the next morning she gets up, she rushes to the airport, and as she's waiting to board her plane, she grabs a newspaper from a nearby kiosk, and the headline reads, Naturalist Beheaded at Yosemite. And that's when she understood why that person could not tell her whether or not this was her daughter based on hair color. It's because this body did not have a head. But from the time she got that phone call to this headline running in the paper, these searchers had found the head. It was located 27 feet away under some brush and they were able to confirm that it was the body of Joey Armstrong. Joey's death was immediately treated like a homicide and right away the public began to openly suggest that maybe Joey's murder is connected to the murders of Carol, Julie, and Sylvina from four months earlier. Even though the police were still saying we have our killers behind bars for those murders Joey's murder is completely unconnected. Luckily, the public and the police did not have to argue for very long about who was right about this because there was a break in Joey's case almost immediately. On the night that Joey went missing, another Yosemite staff member had happened to drive by her cabin and they noticed a distinctive SUV parked outside of her cabin that they didn't recognize.
recognize. It was a blue 1979 International Scout. And as it happened, there were only two of these particular types of vehicles registered in Yosemite Valley. And so within 24 hours, the police had tracked down one of these two vehicles. It was located about 12 miles away from the western entrance of Yosemite and was pulled off the side of this highway. The police pulled up alongside it and parked. They walked up. There was no one inside of this vehicle. But then down this embankment off the highway led down to this forest where there was a river kind of out of sight that people like to swim and fish in. And so these two officers decide to head down and see if maybe the driver is down there. So they make their way down and sure enough they come in contact with the driver. He was laying on this rock completely nude smoking marijuana and so the two officers they come up to him and announce themselves and this very well built good looking guy stands up and he calmly covers himself and he takes the marijuana out of his mouth and he says hey what can I do for you guys? And so over the course of their conversation the police would learn this guy's name was Kerry Stainer. He was 38 years old and he was the handyman at Cedar Lodge Motel. He would tell police that he was not anywhere near Joey's cabin on the night she went missing and the police ultimately bought it and said okay you know they confiscated his marijuana and then they walked back up the hill leaving him down there and they took some pictures of his car and the tires on his car and then they left a couple of days later, some FBI investigators that had been called in for this case, they analyzed those pictures those officers had taken of the tires of Carrie's car, and they compared them to pictures of the tire tracks at Joey's cabin, and they determined they were a perfect match. So later that day, which was July 24th, police officers went back out and tracked Kerry down again. This time he was having lunch at one of his favorite spots. It was a nudist resort about three hours northwest of the Cedar Lodge. There he was arrested on the suspicion of murdering Joey Armstrong and he was brought in for questioning. As soon as he was walked into the police station and was booked, Kerry dropped a bombshell. He confessed to not only murdering Joey Armstrong, but also he confessed to murdering Carol Sund, along with her daughter, Julie Sund, and Sylvina Peloso, the friend of Julie Sund. And he did all of this on his own. He had no other accomplices, which means the police never had the killer or killers behind bars. It would turn out Eugene Dykes, who was one of their primary suspects, was lying when he made those self-incriminating remarks about he and his half-brother, Michael. And as for those synthetic fibers that were found on Eugene and Michael, those fibers belonged to a very commonly sold blanket. And so they did not definitively tie Michael and Eugene to the crime. So for half a year in 1999, there really was a serial killer just roaming free in Yosemite National Park, just like many people who lived in that area and like some people in the media had speculated. <laughs> Kerry would go on to give a very detailed and graphic six hour long confession of how he went about killing all four women. This is his awful story. On February 14th, 1999, so the day that Carol, Julie, and Sylvina arrived at Cedar Lodge, Kerry was on his way to his girlfriend's house. His girlfriend, like Kerry, worked at the Cedar Lodge. She was a waitress at their 1950s style diner. That night, as Kerry walked up her front walkway towards her front door, he made up his mind that he was going to act on a fantasy he had had since he was seven years old. And that fantasy was to kill a young woman. And so his plan that night was he would go and Side, and he would not only kill his girlfriend, but he would also kill her two daughters who were 10 and 11 years old at the time. But when he went inside the house and was about to carry out this plan, he noticed out one of their windows, there was a man in their backyard. And he asked his girlfriend, who's that guy out there? And she would say, oh, you know, I hired someone to take care of our property. So he's gonna be cutting the grass and, you know, doing some things with our garden. He's gonna be here for a little bit, but he'll stay outside. And so this totally screwed up Carrie's plan because he was not expecting there to be anybody there that night. And so for several hours, Carrie anxiously sat there constantly looking out the window, waiting for this guy to leave so he could kill these three people. But the worker was just taking a lot of time and it didn't seem like he was even close to being done. And so finally, Carrie left without any explanation. Angry and frustrated, he began driving back to Cedar Lodge where he had an apartment on the second floor. And when he pulled into the parking lot, he noticed there was a car he had not seen earlier in the day. It was a 1999 red Pontiac Grand and pre. And suddenly, Kerry had this urge to find out who owned that car. And maybe if he was lucky, it was a woman who owned that car and she was potentially alone. And if that was the case, he could fulfill his fantasy on this woman and not worry about the fact that he couldn't kill his girlfriend and her two kids. And so Kerry parked his car a little bit
little bit away from this red car and he walked over to the room that was right in front of this red car. And it was room 509. And he peeked behind one of the curtains into the room, which was all lit up. And he couldn't believe his luck. There were three women inside of this room. It was Carol, Julie, and Sylvina. And so Carrie stayed back and continued looking through the window just to make sure there wasn't a man inside of this room. And after a while of watching them go in and out of the bathroom and nobody coming into the room but these three women and no men coming into the room from the outside, he was certain they were alone. And so when Carrie finally turned around and left to go back to his room, he made the decision that he was going to come back the next day and kill them. The next day, which was February 15th, Carrie secretly followed the three women when they hopped in their rental and drove to Yosemite. He followed them to the parking lot and then he waited in the parking lot until the women had finished going through the park and having this wonderful time. He trailed them from the parking lot back to the Cedar Lodge and then he secretly followed them when they went to that diner and they had hamburgers for dinner and he continued to follow them from a distance and watch them rent movies from the front desk and he followed them all the way back to their room. And once he knew they were inside their room and he watched them long enough to confirm they were not going to leave again, he went back to his room and he got his toolbox. In his toolbox was rope, duct tape, a knife, and a gun. And then around 11 p.m., he left his apartment and went downstairs and walked all the way back over to that corner room, room 509, where the women were. And he looked in the window and it was totally dark inside, so he assumed they must be sleeping and he knocked on the door. A few minutes later, Carol came to the door and very cautiously opened it up just a crack, leaving that chain link lock still attached. And so she looked through at Carrie and said, hi, can I help you? And Carrie, who held up his handyman toolbox and pointed to his name tag that said he was the Cedar Lodge handyman, he said, hi ma'am, sorry to disturb you so late, but there is a leak in the room right above yours and I need to make sure the leak is not coming down into your room. So can I come in and just have a quick look and then I'll be out of here. And Carol apparently was just not buying it and she said look I haven't seen any leaks in this room I don't think there is one but even if there is can it please wait until tomorrow because we're all trying to sleep but Carrie was very persistent and Carrie was known to be very charming and very disarming and eventually he talked his way into the room and so he walks inside he walks past the bed where the other two teen girls are still sleeping he goes into the bathroom and for a few minutes he kind of pretends to fiddle around inside of the bathroom while Carol is standing right outside looking in at him and then at some point Carrie reached into his toolbox, pulled out the gun, and he aimed it at Carol, and he said, stay calm, I'm not gonna hurt you, this is just a robbery. Carol most likely believed their best chance at getting out of this situation was just to comply and do what he says, he'll rob us and then he'll leave and we'll be okay. And so Carol very dutifully went back into the room and she quietly woke up her daughter and her daughter's friend, and before long, Carrie had tied up all three of them. He put the two teenagers in the bathroom and shut the door, and then he put Carol on the bed. And then he proceeded to assault Carol before strangling her to death with more rope. And then after she was dead, he carried her body outside of the motel room and put her in the trunk of her own rental car. And then after he shut the trunk, he went back inside the motel room. He went to the bathroom, he opened it up. He grabbed Sylvina who was crying and pulled her out. And he left Julie alone cowering inside the bathroom by herself. He shut the door behind her and then he brought Sylvina over to the bed where he assaulted her before strangling her as well to death with some additional rope. And then after Sylvina Sylvina was dead, he carried her body outside of the motel and put her in the trunk of the rental car along with Carol's body. And then after that, he went back inside the motel room and then once again, he opened up the bathroom door, he grabbed Julie, pulled her out and proceeded to assault her as well. But then afterwards, he did not strangle her to death. Instead, he walked her back into the bathroom and shut and locked the door. And while she was in there wondering what's gonna happen to her, what happened to her mom, what happened to her friend, he proceeded to clean up the room and tidy it up. And he moved all of their luggage out of their room and put it into the rental car. And then after he was satisfied, he went back inside the motel room, he opened up the bathroom door, he pulled Julie out and had her stand right outside the bathroom. And then Carrie proceeded to clean up the bathroom but left a couple of wet towels on the ground to give the impression that the women had left in a bit of a hurry. And so after that, he grabbed Julie and he walked her out to the car and he sat her down in the front seat. She only had a blanket on at this point. Everything else had been taken off of her. And then Carrie hopped in the front seat and he began driving off. 
Julie must have been beyond terrified. She has no idea where her mom is. She has no idea where her friend is. She has no idea they're actually dead, locked in the trunk right behind her. And the man that had just assaulted her for hours is now driving her into the darkness. She has no idea where she's going and all she's got is this blanket around her. It's just beyond brutal what's happening to this poor girl. And so for two hours, Carrie drove them west along the highway in the middle of the night. And the whole time he's trying to make small talk with this poor girl, trying to tell her that she's gonna be okay and that her mom and her friend, they're gonna be okay. And then finally he pulls off the highway down some switchbacks into this big parking lot of the Don Pedro Lake. And then once he parks the car, there's no other cars around. It's still dark out, the sun hasn't come up. He gets out and he tells Julie to get out of the car. But Julie is so scared, she can't move. So she can't even get out of the car. And so Carrie gets out, he walks around to her side, he opens the door and he scoops her up like you might hold a baby. And he walked with her up the trail all the way to this overlook that was well away from any prying eyes in the parking lot. And once he was out of sight, he took her blanket off and he laid it down. And then he proceeded to assault her again. And then as the sun began to come up over the lake, Carrie realized that he had to end his fantasy and begin to cover his tracks. And so Carrie stops what he's doing. He stands up, he reaches down and pulls Julie up to her feet. And so she's standing with her back to the lake. And as he's looking at her, he says, I love you. And then he pulls out his knife and begins hacking her throat. And then he pushes her down the hillside where she tumbles and finally comes to a stop underneath some bushes where she dies. Carrie grabbed the blanket on the ground and he walked back to the rental car in the lot. There was nobody out there, so he hopped inside. He drove out of the lot and drove one hour north until he was well into this forest. And he pulled down a logging road where he abandoned this car. After he ditched it, he walked back up to the highway and caught a cab back to Cedar Lodge. He would come back to the car and torch it two days later. He would also make a special trip to Modesto, California, where he would drop Carol's wallet in the middle of the road near a high school in order to confuse investigators. A month later, when Carol and Sylvina's body were found in the back of the burned out car, Carrie would send that handwritten note to police that had the map of where Julie's body was and that horrible message of, we had fun with this one referencing Julie. He sent that to police in order to further confuse them. He wanted them to believe that there really was more than one person perpetrating these murders, hence the we had fun with this one. Months would go by and the police, despite questioning Kerry along with the other Cedar Lodge staff members, never considered him a suspect. And that was because one, they really thought he was just a nice normal guy and couldn't be capable of committing violence against these three women. And two, probably most importantly, the police discovered when Kerry was a child, his younger brother was kidnapped by a pedophile and held for seven years. And although his brother was ultimately returned to the family alive, that experience was incredibly traumatic and devastating to Carrie. And so the police figured there's no way this guy would ever abduct or harm other people because he knows how traumatic and awful that is for the victim and the victim's family. If anything, Carrie seemed like the type of guy who would go out of his way to protect and save these three women from being abducted or from being harmed. In July of that year, so four months after the three women's bodies were discovered, Carrie, who believed he had completely gotten away with murder, and to that point he really had, he was just driving around Yosemite, kind of reveling in the fact that he had gotten to live out this fantasy and not get punished for it, when he noticed there was this woman way off in the distance walking in and out of this cabin that was fairly isolated. And so he drove his 1979 International Scout Blue SUV down this forested road and he reaches this meadow and he looks across this meadow and now that this woman is even closer, he can tell she's clearly loading things into her truck and she's going back and forth, back and forth. And he's watching, wondering if there's anybody else helping her because this cabin is very secluded. And he's thinking if she's alone, I might be able to kill her too. And so after a while, when he only sees her loading things into her white pickup truck, he decides he's gonna go kill her. And so he drives across the meadow and he pulls up right next to her truck and he gets out and he introduces himself. And the woman is so completely caught off guard by this random strange man showing up in the middle of the night, suddenly acting so friendly that kind of reflexively in an effort not to be rude, she says, hi, you know, I'm Joey Armstrong. Nice to meet you. What are you doing down here? And Carrie would proceed to spark up some small talk. He asked her if she believed in Bigfoot and they kind of got on this tangent about Bigfoot. And then at some point, Carrie drew a pistol and he aimed it at her and said, go inside your cabin. And so Joey 
Joey put her hands up and she went inside the cabin like she was told and Carrie followed her inside and then he bound her wrists and he bound her mouth with duct tape and then he ordered her to get back inside of his SUV. And then once she was sitting inside the front passenger seat, Carrie got in the driver's seat and he began leaving the cabin, headed back out away towards that road he came in on. And as he's bombing across the meadow, Joey leaps head first out of the window of this moving car and smashes onto the ground and she immediately jumps up and just starts running back towards the cabin. Carrie jams on the brakes, he hops out and he starts chasing after Joey, but Joey manages to get fairly close to that tree line right behind the cabin before Carrie ultimately grabs her and tackles her to the ground. And then Joey is viciously trying to fight Carrie off of her and Carrie kind of in a panic draws his knife and he tries to slash at Joey, but Joey tucks her chin protecting her neck from being stabbed. And so frustrated, Carrie just stands up and he grabs Joey by the hair and he begins hauling her towards the forest behind her cabin. And the whole time Joey's doing everything in her power to try to escape, but she just can't. And finally they get inside the woods and Carrie drags her into this ditch. And once she's down at the bottom, he puts his foot on the top of her head and forces it back, forcibly exposing her throat. And then at that point, he pulls out his knife and he begins to cut. Afterwards, Carrie considered keeping Joey's head, but ultimately he would try to hide it in some bushes nearby. After Carrie attempted to cover up some of the blood in the area with some branches and leaves, he left the forest and went back to his SUV. He didn't even attempt to tidy up the scene. He left her truck as is, he left her cabin as is. He just hopped in his SUV and drove back to Cedar Lodge. Carrie would tell police that as soon as he killed Joey Armstrong, all he wanted to do was go kill his girlfriend and her two young daughters, the 10 and 11 year old. But police caught him before he could carry out the attack. Carrie Stainer, who never showed any remorse for his victims, was ultimately sentenced to death and is currently awaiting execution in San Quentin Prison in Northern California. One of the more distressing aspects of this case was Carol's camera that was found intact near the burned out car in the woods. The police would develop the pictures on this camera in hopes there would be some clue as to who murdered them, but it would turn out there wasn't any usable evidence on the camera. It was just pictures of Carol, her daughter, and Sylvina having this wonderful time in Yosemite, and that was it. But after Carrie confessed to what he did to these poor women, those pictures take on a whole new, much darker meaning. In the final eight images of the camera roll, we know Carrie Stainer was either literally watching these women secretly at the time the picture was taken, or he was patiently waiting nearby for them to return. The final image that was taken on this camera was taken by Julie of her mother sitting on the bed and her friend Sylvina sitting on the other bed as they're getting ready to turn out the lights and go to sleep. That picture was taken just moments before Carrie knocked on their door. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, for the like button's next birthday, get them a gift certificate that looks fairly generic and tell them it's to Alfredo's Pizza Cafe. But in reality, it's to Pizza by Alfredo, a much lesser pizza establishment. In 1971, a 19-year-old Irishman named William began studying physics and computer science at a university in Belfast, Northern Ireland. While he was certainly smart enough to complete the four-year degree, after one year of being in the school, he decided to drop out because he felt like this was not the path he wanted to be on. So he moved back home to a town about 30 minutes north of Belfast, where he got a job as a forklift driver and truck driver for the Guinness Beer Factory. And while he loved this job, he still felt like this was not the path for him. He needed to do something more with his life. And so he decided he would pursue what two of his siblings had gone on to do, which was to become a school teacher. He had always admired his school teachers growing up and he idolized his two siblings that had become teachers. And so it felt like the right fit. And so William applied to a four year teaching college in Newcastle in England. And after he was accepted, he flew to England, he got set up and then he began his studies. The first year was great. He loved what he was doing. He did feel like this is the right fit and he was getting good grades. Everything was going exactly to plan. 
but then year two happened and everything went off the rails. A requirement to graduate from this four-year teaching college was all the aspiring teachers starting in their second year had to go teach real students real lessons. They basically had to go to high schools and elementary schools and fill in for the real teacher and give a real lesson. And they were scored on their ability to do that. But all the aspiring teachers knew that when you gave these real lessons to real students, what really ended up happening was the students did not take the aspiring teachers seriously. They viewed them as kind of like substitute teachers, and so they didn't respect them and they didn't listen to them. And so typically, these real teaching sessions just turned into the aspiring teachers desperately trying to calm down their pupils long enough to get them to listen to their lesson plan for just one second but normally it didn't work out and before long the day was over and nothing was really accomplished. So in William's second year, when it was his turn to go over to a high school and administer his lesson plan, he went over there knowing what he was up against. He did not really expect it to go well, but he decided he would go in there with a positive attitude and he would try to do his best. But as soon as he walked into his classroom, he immediately could tell he was gonna be overwhelmed. Everybody's standing up and talking amongst themselves and they turn around and they see William walking in and they have this moment of realization that their real teacher is not gonna be teaching them that day. It's gonna be this substitute, William, and they all kind of gleefully began laughing and joking and they just turned their backs on William and kept talking amongst themselves. And so William goes inside, he puts his stuff on the desk and he attempts to get the class to listen to him by saying, hey everyone, come on, sit down, time to listen up. I'm your new teacher for the day. But the kids just were not listening. And so finally, William, who was a really big guy, he was six foot four, he was in great shape, he kind of postured himself and then yelled at the class, sit down right now. And at this, the class did turn around and looked at William and kind of sized him up. And most of them decided, okay, it's time to sit down. And so 99% of the class goes quiet and sits down except for one kid. It was this 15 year old boy who was at the back of the room and he was standing up defiant with his arms crossed, staring at William with a smirk on his face. And all around him, all his cronies were sitting down looking up at him, laughing and kind of looking up at William and laughing at him, knowing that a confrontation was about to ensue. And so William is staring at this kid, trying to get him to just sit without saying anything. And this kid is just mean mugging him with his arms crossed and nothing's happening. And so William walks right up to him and kind of leans over his shoulder and says, you need to go out in the hallway right now. I will meet you out there. And then William turned around and started walking back towards the front of the room, expecting this to have worked, that this 15 year old kid would have just followed right along and he'd walk right out to the hallway and that would be that. But when he turned back around again, the 15 year old kid had not moved. He was still standing in the back of the classroom, arms crossed, staring up at William, basically saying, make me. And at this, William lost his mind. He was so mad and so frustrated at how unbelievably disrespectful this kid was being, and really the whole class was being to him, that he just kind of lost it. And he ran up to this kid in the back of the room and he gets right up in his face. And remember, William is six foot four. He's a big guy. And he gets right in the kid's face and he's like, get out in the hall right now. And this kid doesn't flinch. Instead, he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a knife and he holds it right up against William. And William, without any hesitation, just winds up and blasts this kid across the side of the head, sending him flying over a kid sitting at a desk. He goes flying over this kid and crumples into the corner. And then when he stands up, he drops the knife and puts his hands up and he's like, okay, okay, I'll go out in the hall. And William's like, go, go out in the hall right now. And so the kid ran out of the classroom. He goes out into the hall and the whole class is totally silent. No one even wants to look up at William. They're all kind of just looking down at their desk, trying to be as quiet as possible. And William walks back to the front of the class and proceeds to teach the rest of the lesson. As soon as the high school learned that this aspiring teacher, William, had basically knocked out one of their students, even though it seemed like it might have been a little bit deserved, they immediately told the teacher's college and the teacher's college immediately expelled William. And so now William is suddenly jobless and he's kind of lost again in the world. He doesn't know what he wants to do now because he really had committed to being a teacher. And so he goes back to his home in Northern Ireland and he begins thinking about, you know, what is he gonna do next? And he keeps having this thought that he should pursue this thing that he's always been interested in, but he had never taken seriously because it felt so risky. But now that basically everything in his life had fallen apart, he had nothing to lose. So he decided, what the heck, I will do the thing that I've always wanted to do. 
and that was stage acting. And so he went and auditioned with a local theater company in Belfast. He was accepted into the theater troupe. And then four years later, he was discovered performing on stage by a Hollywood filmmaker. And they cast him in a movie and the rest, as they say, is history. William Neeson, better known as Liam Neeson, would go on to star in dozens of huge movies and TV shows. And he's probably best known for his epic role in the movie Taken, where he is this CIA operative with a particular set of skills. And in this movie, he punches a lot of people in the face, just like when he was a teacher. In 1963, when Tim Dick was just 10 years old, he went over to his friend's house and he snuck a bottle of whiskey from one of their shelves. He pulled it out and he poured himself a full glass to the brim with whiskey, and then he downed it in one huge gulp. Tim had grown up idolizing cowboys on TV, and every time he watched them, they would come galloping into some town, they would go into the saloon, and they would sit at the bar just throwing back shots of whiskey. And so Tim always assumed whiskey must be this totally amazing, refreshing drink for these guys to be drinking it out in the heat of the desert. But unfortunately for Tim, after he slugged this huge glass of whiskey, it was not refreshing. It tasted like gasoline and his chest felt like it was on fire. But instead of being turned off by alcohol and waiting until he was older and of age to try it again, Tim instead thought, you know what? The next time I have whiskey, I just need to water it down a little bit. And so for the next year, Tim continued to periodically sneak whiskey out of his friend's cabinets and he would drink this watered down whiskey. And then when he turned 11 years old, his father, who he was very close with, died tragically in a car accident. And Tim really didn't have a good way to cope with the grief of losing his father. And so he turned to drinking even more than he already was. And before long, Tim was like this young kid who basically was an alcoholic but he hit it extremely well. He graduated high school, he graduated college, and really nobody knew he was drinking as much as he was. But after he graduated college and he was living on his own in Michigan, there was no structure in place or person in place to stop Tim from going overboard with his substance abuse. And so not only did his drinking get completely out of control, but he began using and selling drugs, namely cocaine. In 1978, when Tim was 25 years old, he and his drug dealer partner were scheduled to take part in the biggest drug deal of their careers. They would be selling about a pound and a half of cocaine to a guy named Michael Pfeiffer, and he'd be buying it for $42,000, which when you adjust that for inflation would be like buying it for $175,000 in 2021. Tim and his partner were very excited about all this money they were going to make, but they were equally worried about the transaction. A lot can go wrong. And so Tim decided in order to mitigate their nerves and kind of make this a safer drug deal, he decided they would do the transaction inside of a public airport because Tim had seen that done on TV and believed that would give them an additional layer of safety. And so on the day this deal is going to take place, Tim takes the pound and a half of cocaine, he puts it inside of a brown, Adidas gym bag, and he also throws a key lock inside of this bag. He zips it up, he walks outside, he dumps the bag in the back of his car, and he drives to the Kalamazoo International Airport in Michigan. When he gets there, he parks in the big parking lot right outside of the front doors. And as soon as he's parked, he goes around to the back of his car, he pulls out this brown Adidas bag, he throws it over his shoulder, shuts his trunk, and then he waits for his partner to show up. A couple of minutes later, right on time, his partner pulls into the lot, he parks nearby, and then the two of them very casually begin walking towards the front doors of this airport. They walk up the steps, they go in the front doors, and as soon as they're inside, they're looking around and they find Michael Pfeiffer. He's standing up against the wall right in the area he had said he would be. And so without making any sort of contact with Michael, Tim and his partner turn the corner and they go into a nearby locker room. Once they're inside, Tim pulls the lock out of the brown bag and then he puts the bag with the drugs in it inside of a locker. He shuts it and then uses the lock he had just pulled out to lock the locker. And then he and his partner leave the locker room. As soon as they go out into the main terminal, they start walking over towards Michael Pfeiffer. And as they get closer and closer, Tim's partner breaks off and goes to a bench on 
on the other side of the terminal and Tim continues walking on right up to Michael. And then when he reaches Michael, he very discreetly hands him the key to the lock on the locker and he tells him which locker number the drugs are in. Michael doesn't say anything. He takes the key and he heads off to the locker room. Tim turns and he goes over to his partner and he sits down on the bench and waits. Meanwhile, Michael goes inside the locker room. He uses the key. He opens up the lock. He opens the locker up. He checks to make sure the drugs are still there. They are. As soon as that's confirmed, he takes the bag, he throws it over his shoulder, and he walks back out to the main terminal to meet up with Tim and his partner. Tim and his partner are sitting on the bench. They see Michael coming out of the locker room, and they're expecting Michael to walk over and basically hand them a bag full of $42,000. But instead, Michael walks up to them and draws a gun and points it at them and says, I'm a police officer. You're under arrest. It would turn out this was a sting operation. Michael Pfeiffer, the undercover police officer, had been following around Tim and his partner for months. In Michigan at the time, if you were caught trying to sell 650 grams or more of cocaine, there was an automatic penalty of a life sentence. And Tim and his partner had just been arrested trying to sell more than 650 grams of cocaine. And so facing a life sentence, Tim took a deal that gave him a lesser sentence in exchange for information about other drug dealers. And so Tim would ultimately serve two years and four months in a federal penitentiary before he was released. Tim would say his time in prison was absolutely miserable, but it was necessary. It matured him in a major way and it honed his sense of humor. Tim was always a very funny guy. He was always the class clown and the guy goofing around, but in prison, he found it a very difficult task to get these hardened prisoners and prison guards to laugh at his jokes. But eventually, with enough practice and repetition, he could get anybody in that prison to laugh at him. And so by the time he got out, he was like an amazing comedian. And so he decided, you know what? Why don't I pursue a career in comedy? Four years later, Tim Dick, better known as as Tim Allen landed the starring role on the hit TV show Home Improvement. And from there, he starred in dozens more movies and TV shows, but he's probably best known for his voice acting in the very popular movie series Toy Story, where he plays Buzz Lightyear. Today, Tim is sober and has been for decades. In 1964, during his final semester of college in Wisconsin, a 21-year-old man named Harry decided to take an acting class. He believed it would be an easy A, and he'd always been pretty shy, and so he figured this class might be able to help him get over that. But this class wound up having a much larger impact on Harry's life than he ever could have imagined. Not only did he meet his future wife in this class, but he also realized he loved acting, something he never thought he would like, and he decided after college that that was the thing he was going to pursue. And so after he graduates later that year, he and his girlfriend get married, and then they fly out to Hollywood, California, where Harry auditions for Columbia Pictures' new talent program, which is basically this program that's designed to help new actors and actresses get parts in Hollywood because it's so hard to do that. And so he's accepted into this program. He signs a contract with them that pays him almost nothing. And right away, they start shopping him around for different parts in TV shows and movies, but no Nobody is interested in Harry. Nobody. The only roles he was getting were incredibly minor and usually non-speaking, and so it was really not advancing his career. Then, in 1966, so two years after he and his wife had arrived in Hollywood, Harry received what seemed like his first big break. He was offered a speaking role in a movie, although it was a very minor role. It was a 60-second bit where Harry basically walked on screen in this hotel, and he started calling out for a particular guest, and when he finds this guest, he walks up and gives him a piece of paper and then he leaves. So it's a forgettable scene, but it's a real scene in a real movie. And so this was a big deal for Harry. And so after Harry goes over to the studio and he films this whole scene and it's all done, he goes back over to the headquarters of the new talent program at Columbia Pictures. And as soon as he goes inside, one of the producers that was in charge of this new talent program, who had apparently had a chance already to see this 60 second scene in this movie that Harry was in, he calls Harry over and asks him to go up to his office for a second. And so the pair go up to his office, they both sit down, and the guy looks at him and says, look, I just gotta shoot you straight here. You're not gonna make it in Hollywood. You're not gonna be a movie star. 
When Tony Curtis was told to carry groceries across this room in one of his first movies, everybody knew right away as he's carrying those groceries that that guy, he's going to be a movie star. You could see it in the scene, even though all he was doing was carrying groceries. And when you did your scene as the bellhop walking around the hotel, I just didn't see it. You don't have the X factor. You're not going to be a movie star. For reference, Tony Curtis, the guy this producer was referencing, was a huge movie star in the 1950s and 1960s. And so Harry, after getting this horrible comment made about him, he pauses for a second, and then he leans across the table and looks at this producer and squints his eyes and says, you know, if Tony was such a good actor, shouldn't we have believed he was just a grocery delivery boy, not a movie star? And at this totally smart aleck remark, the producer fired Harry on the spot. Harry would go on to sign a similar new talent program deal with Universal Studios, but again, he could not get a real part to save his life. And the feedback he finally got was, Harry, you're just not pretty enough and you're not really that talented. By the mid 1970s, Harry was in his mid thirties and while he still aspired to be an actor and wanted to be an actor, he was making almost no money from acting. And so he decided instead of acting, he was going to become a carpenter. That was going to be his full-time job. Despite the fact he knew nothing about carpentry. And so he literally, just because he has this interest in carpentry, goes to the library and checks out all these how to be a carpenter books. And over the next couple of weeks, he studies these books and does a couple projects around his own house. And then finally, he just felt confident enough or he was just desperate enough for money that he began going around to his network and asking people in Hollywood if they needed some woodworking, if they needed help from a carpenter. And surprisingly, lots of people took him up on his offer and they hired him to be their carpenter. And before long, Harry Harry was dubbed the Carpenter to the Stars, which was kind of ironic because he actually was not a very good carpenter and he was regularly seen on the job literally holding a book teaching him how to be a carpenter while doing the carpentry with his other hand. In 1976, Harry was a full-fledged carpenter and had been for about a year when one of his very close friends named Fred Roos, who was a casting director and film producer, gave him a call and told him he had a very unique opportunity for him. Now, at this point, Harry was not looking for any more acting roles. He kind of figured that that ship has sailed, even though he wishes he could be an actor. At this point, he had a wife, he had two sons, and so he's thinking, I gotta just keep doing this carpentry thing because I gotta pay the bills. So he says to Fred, you know, I appreciate the offer of whatever this is, but if it has to do with acting, you know, I'm, I'm just not interested. And Fred, who was one of the very few people in Hollywood who fundamentally believed Harry was destined to be a star, told Harry, no, 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 this is different. This is not a pure go out and try out for the part and hope for the best. This is like put yourself in a good position and maybe somebody will discover you're as talented as you really are. And so Harry's like, okay, Tell me about this opportunity, you know, I'm interested. And so Fred explained there was this really talented and eccentric film director who was trying to cast an upcoming movie. And the way he went about casting for movies was a little bit strange. Instead of having each of the actors and actresses show up and individually audition for their parts, he would group batches of actors and actresses and he would have them audition as a group because that way he could tell if there was chemistry amongst some of the actors and actresses and he could gauge their individual talent. And so he had all these groups already planned out, but one of the groups was missing one male actor. Somebody had dropped out at the last minute and was not gonna be there on the day of the audition. And so when Fred Roos heard through the grapevine that this director was gonna be short this one person, he immediately reached out to the director and said, hey, I got your guy. There's this guy, Harry. He's done a little bit of acting. He's incredibly talented. You gotta give him a chance. You know, at the minimum, he can come in there and he can at least just read the lines and help you do this audition but I know he's available that day and I know he would love to help. And so this director tells Fred, okay, thank you. I'd love to have him come down, but stress to him, he is not auditioning for any part in this movie. I'm not bringing in some person and just throwing them in. It takes me a long time to find people that I want to audition and he is not one of them. He is just there to facilitate the audition. He's just going to read the lines so the other people in his group can do their audition. And so after Fred stopped explaining the situation, Harry was actually kind of annoyed. He was annoyed that Fred had basically already volunteered him and so he couldn't really even say no without making Fred look bad. 
and he didn't like the idea that this was basically a waste of his time. He was being asked to go read lines, but not even try out. So how was this even an opportunity? But Fred told him, look, worst case scenario, you meet some pretty powerful people in Hollywood. This director's a big deal. The people there are gonna be big deals in Hollywood. So you'll meet them and maybe they will recognize your talent or maybe you get some new clients for your carpentry business. So no matter what, you get something out of it. And so finally, Harry says, okay, fine, I'll go do this thing. And so Harry goes to this audition, he's handed the script and he's reminded repeatedly to not attempt to audition. Don't try to act, just read the lines. I don't care if you're monotone, you just read these lines because you're not auditioning. Everybody else is, you're not. Is that clear? And Harry's like, yes, I get it. I'm just reading the lines. And so Harry sits down and he starts reading the lines and he's trying to do what they told him to do, but the way he was actually feeling and his actual personality began seeping through. He started coming off as this really grumpy and sarcastic guy that just didn't care about anybody there. He was just totally bitter that he was in the situation he was in. And apparently this is exactly what the director was looking for in one of the characters he was trying to cast. That kind of nonchalant, bravado, macho, alpha type guy who just didn't care about anybody. And so over the course of the day, as he's reading the script over and over again, not caring at all about how he's performing, he's just simply reading these lines and just being himself, he was actually doing this amazing job portraying one of the characters. And so they let Harry go the whole day. No one told him they were looking at him as a potential character. And then at the end of the day, when Harry was about to just throw the script in the trash and leave without talking to anyone, the film director, better known as George Lucas, walks up to Harry, better known as Harrison Ford, and says, wait a minute, I was wrong. You are perfect for this movie, Star Wars you need to play Han Solo. And so Harrison Ford said, all right, I'll play Han Solo. And that role as Han Solo propelled Harrison Ford into the megastar that we know him as today. A few years after Harrison had starred in Star Wars and he was this total A-list celebrity, he was at a Hollywood studio in one of their restaurants when one of the waiters walked over to him with the silver tray and on this silver tray was a single business card. So Harrison reaches over, he grabs the business card, the waiter walks away and he looks at the card and handwritten on it is the phrase, I missed my bet. And he flipped the card over and it was the name of that producer from the new talent program that had called Harry into his office and said, you're never gonna make it in Hollywood and you're fired. It was that guy and he had apparently sent the waiter over to make amends because he was eating lunch in the same restaurant. And so Harrison would later say in interviews that at the time he got this card and to this day that he was doing this interview, he said it gave him immense pleasure that when he looked up from this business card and he understood the situation, he knows this guy's in the room somewhere. As he looked around the room, he couldn't recognize the guy because he didn't know what he looked like. He was a nobody. And so instead of wasting any more time looking for this producer, he just looked at the card, chucked it, and went back to eating his lunch. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please replace the like button's shrewd bucks with Stanley Nichols. Located in the far northwestern section of Canada is the aptly named Northwest Territories. It is a massive swath of land that virtually nobody lives inside of. To make that point crystal clear, consider the following. The country of Germany has a population of 83 million people, give or take. The Northwest Territories is four times as large as Germany, but only has a population of about 50,000 people. In addition to being this huge and mostly unoccupied space, the Northwest Territories are almost completely wild. Think dense forests, huge mountains, massive rivers and lakes, and lots and lots of really big animals. Even for highly experienced outdoors men and women, the Northwest Territories can be a truly hazardous place. And within this truly hazardous place, there is one part that is the most hazardous, and it's right in the middle of the Northwest Territories. And it's this 11,000 square mile stretch of just pure wilderness that's called the Nahani Valley. 
In 1976, the Nahani Valley was made into a national park. But don't let that fool you. This is not some family park that anybody can go to. There are no tourist accommodations, so there's no hotels. There's, there's really nothing inside of it. And there are no roads that lead into this park. The only way you can get inside this valley is by plane or by boat or by very stressful and difficult overland hike. But for those who are able and willing to make the effort to get inside of this valley, you have the opportunity opportunity to explore one of the most beautiful places on the planet because this section of the world is almost completely untouched by man. It is really nature at its purest form. However, there is a catch. This valley is said to be haunted. Over the last 10,000 years, the handful of native tribes that have attempted to settle inside of the Nahani Valley have all either suddenly disappeared without a trace, like the Naha tribe that literally overnight just was gone, leaving behind their shelters, their food, their supplies, just gone. No one knows what happened to them or the tribes have abruptly fled, claiming they were being terrorized or stalked by creatures lurking in the forest, like these white demons and these large wolves they called wahilas. Now, of course, this just sounds like folklore, and it might very well be that that's all it is, folklore. But starting in the early 1900s, some very strange things started happening in the Nahani Valley that were not folklore. These things happened and they were horrifying. These were horrifying real events. And they might, depending on your viewpoint, give credit to some of the theories that the native tribes people have about this valley, which is there's something evil lurking out in this forest but we just don't know what it is. In 1904, three brothers, Willie Frank and Charlie McLeod, who all lived in the Northwest Territories, decided they wanted to go looking for gold in the Nahani Valley. They figured because so few people had ever been inside of this valley, that if there was gold to be found, then certainly it had not been found yet. And so after a very long and arduous journey using sled dogs and trains and homemade boats, they finally slipped into the valley and found themselves on what's called the Flat River, which runs right through the center of the Nahani Valley. Now, the Flat River is kind of ironically named because it's anything but flat. It's actually more like a rapid at certain points. But either way, the three brothers, they're on their boat, they're making their way up the Flat River, and at some point they pull off onto the riverbank and they set up camp. And then once their camp is set up, they go down to the river and they put their gold sluices in the water. A gold sluice is this long, skinny box that's usually made of wood and it has a strainer on one side. And gold Gold miners will put it in the water submerged and they will kind of shovel the sediment on the bottom of the water into this little funnel and the big stuff will get stopped by the strainer and the dirt and the water will just kind of flow out the side. And so the idea is you can trap gold nuggets inside of the sluice. And so the three brothers, they get their sluices up and they start looking for gold and right away they hit pay dirt. There is tons of gold in this river. And so all day, all night, they get all this gold. The next morning, Morning, they do the same thing and by the time all their containers are literally filled to the brim with gold they decide you know hey let's go back and turn this in get some money for it and then come back out here and so they pack up their tent they pack up all their supplies and they put everything back in their boat they get out onto flat river and at some point very early on in their journey back the boat capsizes and the boat actually breaks apart from the strength of the rapids of flat river and so the boat actually just sinks and much of their supplies sink including all all of their gold, but the three brothers are able to grab some of their supplies, like their rifle and some lumber and some of their mining supplies, and they swim it all to shore. They catch their breath. They're totally devastated at the loss of the gold, but they're alive. They have enough supplies to survive. And so they figure all they can do is maybe try to go back to their original site, try to get some more gold because they did still have a sluice, and then try to get out of there and then, you know, regroup and come back another time. And so using some of the lumber they recovered from their broken boat, and then also so by cutting down some trees, they literally fashioned another boat and then hopped back on the flat river and they went back up to that site where they had found gold earlier. They set up their sluice, they set up their camp again, and this time they didn't find any gold. So all day, this very disappointing day that they've already lost all their gold, now they're not finding any more gold. And so that night when they went to bed, they decided that the next day they were just gonna leave. 
And so the next day they get up, they pack up, they hop back on the flat river on this new boat they built, and they're able to make their way out of the valley and get back to their homes. As soon as they get back home, the two younger brothers, Willie and Frank, start talking about how they want to go back into Nahani Valley and go get more gold. Because now they know there's gold out there. It's not a question, yeah, we didn't find it that second time, but we know it's out there. Charlie, the older brother, he wanted to get the gold, but he felt like, you know, hey, that was a close call with the boat flipping over. I don't know if it's a good idea, so I'm actually not going to go. You guys can go. I'm going to stay. And so several months goes by, and Frank and Willie have been doing all this preparation for this additional trip into the valley. And finally, in 1905, they're ready. And so Willie, Frank, and a third man called Robert Weir, who was a friend of theirs, he was going to replace Charlie. The three of them, they make their way up into the valley. Now, they didn't tell anyone how long they were going to be gone for, and so when they didn't send any word and no one had heard from them in weeks, Charlie was actually not that concerned because he knew there was lots of gold to be had out in the Nahani Valley, and so he figured they must have struck it rich, and now they've decided to live out there long term, or at least maybe through the summer or maybe the next year, and so he wasn't concerned, and because he wasn't concerned, nobody else was concerned about these three men, and so weeks turned into months, turned into to a year and still no one's heard from these three men. No one's heard from Willie, Frank, or from Robert, but still Charlie maintains that nothing can be wrong because there's three of them out there. They're incredibly experienced. There is a ton of gold out there. I'm sure they're just killing it and they're just acquiring all this gold and we're going to see them in the next couple of months maybe and everything's going to be just fine. But a whole other year would go by. So they've been out there for two years and no one has heard from them. And at this point, Charlie thinks to himself, okay, you know, I have to go out and see if they're okay. And so he rounds up four other people from his town and he mounts an expedition to head back into the Nahani Valley to go find his two brothers and find Robert Weir. Charlie and his search party eventually, after yet another long and arduous journey, they get into Nahani Valley and they get onto the Flat River. And so they start making their way upstream along Flat River. So it must have been a very treacherous journey getting through the rapids of this river. And the whole time they're scanning the left and the right side hoping to see some sign of life. They're looking for any indication that these three men are out here and just fine, but they didn't see any sign of them. And so they finally made their way all the way up to the very end of Flat River, or I should say the very beginning of Flat River, where it breaks off from a much larger river called the South Nahani River. And once they turned onto the South Nahani River, they began going downstream. And again, they're looking on either side for any sign of these three men. There's no sign of them. And then the river they're on takes a very sharp turn. It's actually called the Big Bend, and it's about a 45 degree turn. And as soon as you make that turn, it dumps you into this 10 mile stretch of river called Second Canyon. Now along South Nahani River, which is about 350 miles long, there are these four canyons that the water passes through. And they're labeled Fourth Canyon, Third Canyon, Second Canyon, and First Canyon. And these canyons are massive. These sheer cliffs on either side of the river shoot up up to three thousand feet above the water and in some parts the water is actually just as deep thousands of feet deep and second canyon is unique because the cliff faces are as sheer as you're going to get and the cliff faces almost butt up exactly up against the water so there's really very little shoreline on either side so once you're in this 10 mile stretch you're basically boxed in you have thousands of feet of water below you you have these massive cliffs on either side and there's really nowhere to go you need to get through this section of the river before you can effectively get onto the shoreline and take a break from being in your boat and along these cliffs are these openings you see high up all over the cliffs on both sides that are openings to these massive cave systems inside of these thousands of feet tall cliffs. And because of how difficult it is to not only get to Nahani Valley, but also to get up to these different cave openings, nobody's gone inside of them. We don't know what's inside of these caves, you know, save for the few that are down low enough that people can explore. So as you're passing through Second Canyon, it's almost like you're being watched because there's all these openings, but you can't see into them and you're just forced to go down this 10 mile stretch and you can't really go anywhere and whatever's watching you, it's watching you. As soon as Charlie and his search party Already entered into Second Canyon, it would have immediately gotten darker because that's another part of being in Second Canyon. These huge cliff walls of this canyon obscure the sunlight. And so they would have entered into this canyon, it would have gotten darker, and 
it's very windy inside of Second Canyon. So the winds would have picked up, so it's dark, very strange setting for them to be in. And they would have been looking on either side at these little strips of shoreline on either side, barely big enough for a boat to be. They would have been looking for any sign of life, but they didn't see anything. As they're making their way down this 10 mile stretch, as they're getting closer and closer to actually entering into First Canyon, which is the next canyon you would enter into, the sides of the river start to get slightly larger where you could actually beach a boat, there's some trees. And on the left-hand side, right before exiting Second Canyon, they notice there is actually a tent perched within some trees. And so the search party naturally goes right over to the shoreline, they hop out, but as soon as they step foot on land and they have a clearer view of this tent and what's outside of it, they notice there is a body clearly lying on the ground outside of the tent. And so Charlie and the search party, they run over, and as soon as they're up close, they can tell this body is missing its head. And they see the clothes on this body are totally charred and burned, and whoever this was, they were reaching with their right arm when they died. And right outside of the reach of their right arm was a rifle that was propped up against a tree. And so they walk around this one body, and they go around towards the backside of the tent where the opening to this tent is, and and they find another body, another very badly decomposed body, and it's positioned kind of halfway in the tent and halfway out of the tent. And there's a blanket kind of partially obscuring this person's body, and when they move the blanket, they see this body too is missing its head. So Charlie and the search party, they continue to search around the camp in hopes of finding the heads of these two people to try to figure out who they are, but they never find the heads. However, they do find some personal effects both in the pockets of these two bodies and then also inside the tent that would confirm these are Charlie's brothers. As for the third man that had been with them, Robert Weir, he was not at the campsite. And in fact, he would never actually be found officially. However, a little ways down the river, another partial skeleton would be found several months later that was attributed to Robert. However, that was not 100% confirmed to be Robert. The only other interesting thing that was found at this campsite was a carving in a nearby tree. And it just said, we have found a fine prospect, indicating that Charlie's brothers had found gold, but there was no gold either on them or in their camp or in the river nearby, nothing, there was no gold. Charlie and his search party would leave the valley and get in touch with the mounted police who would come out to the site where the brothers had been found. They would launch an investigation and ultimately they would come to the conclusion that all three of these men, the two brothers and Robert, had starved to death and then after they had perished, animals had taken them off, which is why Robert was found so far away and why the skulls were missing from the two brothers. Now, Charlie did not believe that. He believed they had been attacked by native tribes in the area, but the police were not buying that. They said this was a natural thing. This was an accident. And so that's that. When the story of these two decapitated men made the news, people went crazy about this. People were very divided about what they thought really happened. There was a percentage of people that believed that partial skeleton that was found, that was not Robert Weir. He had not died. He had murdered the two brothers, decapitated them, and then made off with their gold. The other percentage of people believed that all three men, the two brothers and Robert, had been attacked by a person, a group of people, an animal, a creature, something. There was some sort of attack. And that's why the two brothers were in those positions that indicated they had encountered something horrifying with one brother reaching for the gun and the other appearing to have leapt from his bed before he ultimately died. But regardless of which side you fell on, pretty much everybody at the time who heard about the story became terrified of the Nahani Valley. Specifically, they became terrified of that stretch in Second Canyon where the two brothers had been found. And so actually that stretch got renamed the Headless Valley. And from that point forward, that's all it was known as. And so even though there were obvious gold prospects in the Headless Valley and all along the South Nahani River and the Flat River, people after the story broke were just not prepared to risk going in there and potentially becoming another victim. And so people kind of stayed away from Nahani Valley. Eight years later though, in 1913, a gold prospector named Martin Jorgensen 
and decided, you know what, I'm not going to let some scary stories about some headless men and, you know, ghosts and killers on the loose. I'm not going to let any of that get in the way of me taking gold out of Nahani Valley. So all on his own, Martin makes the arduous trek inside of Nahani Valley. He makes his way up Flat River and he finally finds a spot about 70 miles upstream of where Headless Valley was. And he actually built a one room cabin because he was going to stay there through the winter. And then the plan was he would meet up with his partners the following summer. And so right after he got there, he set up his sluices and he started mining for gold. And apparently he found a lot of it because he sent word back to his partners outside of the valley that he had made it rich. And so his partners were really excited to meet up with him the following summer and see how much he got because they planned on going back into the valley with him that summer. So that summer rolls around, his partners go to the meeting spot right outside the valley, but Martin doesn't show up. And so his partners, they stay outside at this meeting space for several days until finally, you know, when he doesn't show up, they decide, you know, we have to go in there and see if he is okay. Because at this point, he should have been here. There's no excuse. And so they end up going into the Nahani Valley. They make their way up Flat River and they go roughly to the area where they knew he was staying based on the message he had sent earlier. He had described where he was staying and they actually found his cabin or I should say they found what was left of his cabin. His cabin had been completely torched, burned to the ground, and laying on the ground next to the burned out cabin was the burned out remains of another headless corpse. And this corpse belonged to Martin Jorgensen. The police did a thorough investigation, but they were never able to determine what actually killed him. The police did not connect Martin's death with the two McLeod brothers' deaths, even though they were all decapitated, they were in roughly the same area, and it happened within a few years of each other, and they looked very, very similar, even though that all was true. The police said, no, these are totally separate. Martin died for some reason, and then animals took parts of him away, and that's why his skull is missing. Martin's skull was never located, and the gold that Martin claimed to have struck it rich with was also not at the cabin, not on him. There was no gold anywhere in the vicinity. When Martin's death made the news, people went crazy, and despite the police assuring everyone that his death was not connected to the McLeod brothers' deaths, even though the police were saying that, the public didn't see it that way. It was just too easy to connect one decapitation with two other decapitations that have happened close together in a relatively short time frame, and so a lot of people assumed there must be a killer on the loose somewhere in Nahani Valley. Seven years later, in 1921, the rumors of a killer on the loose were still alive and well when gold prospector John O'Brien and his partner decided, you know what, despite the rumors of the so-called killer or whatever's going on in the Nahani Valley, let's go in to the Nahani Valley and try our hand. Let's try to get some gold. And so the two of them made their way into the valley and they set up camp in Headless Valley, not far from where the McLeod brothers had been found decapitated. So they set up their camp and they're there for a couple of days. They're doing well, they're finding gold. And then at some point, John tells his partner that he's gonna go out and check all of their traps along the river. And he'll be back in about eight or nine days. And so his partner waits eight or nine days and John doesn't come back. And a couple of days after that goes by and now John's past due. And so the partner decides he has to go out looking for him. And so there was another gold prospector in the area. And so this partner contacted him and the two of them went to the river and began walking upstream until they found John. And he had frozen to death, but it was very interesting the way he was positioned. He was sitting in front of this obviously previously lit campfire. He wasn't hunched over. He didn't look like he was in pain. He looked like he was just enjoying the fire. There was nothing on his face that indicated discomfort or pain or fear. He was even holding the matchbook in his hand. It was like he was just sitting there enjoying the fire when something caused him to suddenly freeze. In fact, witnesses would say, John looked like he had been flash frozen, as if it had happened in a matter of seconds, because it didn't look like he had reacted properly to freezing to death. And the police, when they came out, they would say, you know, this is odd. This is odd the way he's positioned, but ultimately he died because he froze to death. And so there's no foul play here. And so no further investigation is needed. Five years later in 1926, a hunting party that included a young woman named Annie Lafferty was camping out along the flat river inside of Headless Valley. And so that night, they're all kind of joking around the fire. And then at some point they decide to all go to sleep. And then the next day when everybody gets up, Annie is no longer in camp. 
and there's no sign of where she went. And so they begin by yelling out and walking around the immediate vicinity to see maybe if she stepped away for a minute, but Annie's just gone and no one knows where she went. And so the hunting party spends the rest of the day looking for Annie, but there's no sign of her. They ultimately leave the valley. They tell police, police come out. There's this huge search, but Annie's never found. Several months later, a man named Charlie, who happened to have been out near Flat River, near this hunting party when they were out there, but Charlie himself was not in the hunting party. He didn't know Annie. He was just in the vicinity. He overheard someone talking about a member of that hunting party, specifically a woman, going missing. And when he heard that, he knew he had to tell police what he had seen that night out near Flat River. So he goes to police and he explains that that night when he knew there was this hunting party over there, he could hear them, he knew they were over there. He said at some point he went to bed and then he woke up when he heard the sound of rocks falling into the river in front of him. He was sleeping along the river's edge. So he sits up and he looks out across the river. It's totally dark, but there's some moonlight and he's kind of looking around wondering what's causing the sound, but he can't see it. And then he hears it again and he can tell it's off to his left. And these are not huge rocks. These are like medium to small size rocks, like rocks you could just pick up and throw. And so he's looking and all of a sudden he sees maybe a couple hundred yards away through some sparse trees, he sees a naked woman, a white naked woman running on all fours up this mountainside. And as she's running up the mountainside, her feet and her hands are knocking little rocks into the river down below. She's right on the edge of this cliff. And as she's running up this hill, she stops and she turns and he gets a good look at her face. And Charlie would say he was so taken aback by her face. It looked like she was possessed. There was something wrong with her face. And so Charlie instinctively ducked down and chose not to follow her, even though he knew anybody running naked anywhere in the wilds is doomed. But he felt like he could not go near this woman. There was something wrong with this woman. And so the police, they take the story down and they say, hey, you know, this is what Annie looked like. And Charlie would say, I mean, I, I think that's her. I think that matches her description. And so universally it's believed this woman galloping up this hillside in the middle of the night naked was Annie. The police ultimately would not investigate Annie's disappearance any further because at the time Charlie was telling them this piece of information, she had already been gone for months and the assumption was she was dead. Four years later in 1931, another gold prospector decides to try their luck in Headless Valley, a man named Phil Powers. He makes his way into the valley. He finds a spot off of Flat River. He builds a cabin. And then shortly thereafter, his cabin burns to the ground with him inside of it. Now his skeleton was in intact, but the strange thing about his death is based on the origin of the fire, which would have been on the roof. He should have had an opportunity to climb out of the cabin before it burned down, giving rise to the theory that he was actually dead before the fire started. However, the police said this was an accident caused by Phil doing something with the stove pipe that led to it catching on fire, and this was just all one big accident. But the vast majority of people that have followed along to this point with all of these strange deaths, they were just not buying it. Five years later, in 1936, two more gold prospectors, William Epler and Joseph Mulholland, they entered the Headless Valley to try their luck, and shortly after arriving and getting set up, they went missing. A search party came out to look for them and they found their cabin and just like Phil Powers, it had burned to the ground, but William and Joseph were not in the ashes. They were not anywhere nearby. In fact, they were never found. No one has any idea what happened to them and no one knows what caused the fire. Nine years later in 1945, yet another gold prospector named Ernest Sabbard entered the Headless Valley to go looking for gold. And then when he did not leave the valley for an intended rendezvous with some of his partners, his partners went looking for him and they would find him inside of a sleeping bag laying down, decapitated right along the flat river inside of the Headless Valley. And so the police would come out, they would do an investigation and they would call this an accident where, you know, he starved to death or he died of hypothermia. And then after he was dead, animals must have come in and removed his skull. And that's why we can't find it. And so the police did not, at least not publicly, connect his death to all of the other decapitations in that small area. One year later in 1946, another gold miner named John Patterson went into Headless Valley and he went missing. And so a search party went in looking for him and John would never be found. But on one of the last nights that the search party was in the Headless Valley, they were camping out near Flat River, some native tribespeople came into their camp 
and they warned them about some white figures that were walking around the valley that night. They're down near the river, they're out in the forest, they're kind of all around here, and so you really need to be careful. You don't want them to see you. And then these tribespeople just left. And so the search party is absolutely horrified. They know about the rumors of this place. They're out here looking for someone that's gone missing in this place. And all night, all they hear are distant howls and screams that they hadn't heard in the previous nights. They're hearing these wailing sounds coming from all around them, like these things that are out there were intentionally trying to scare them to get them to leave. It felt like they were not supposed to be there. The next day, first thing when they got up and they left, the leader of that search party would say he just felt like the whole valley was totally sinister. And that constant wailing they heard the night before, he said he will never forget. From the mid 1940s onward, there have been far less strange incidents reported inside of Nahani Valley, but one could attribute that to the fact that far less people have been going into Nahani Valley ever since the 1940s. And in recent times, huge segments of the park have been permanently closed. The park has said the reason they're doing that is to protect that segment of the park. But other people have speculated that at least part of the reason why they're closing these segments, many of which are right near the Headless Valley, is because they're trying to protect people from getting anywhere near whatever it is that's lurking inside of that park. But regardless, it is still a fact that over the last century, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of people that have either gone missing or who have died under very mysterious circumstances inside of this valley. And the truth is, nobody knows why. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to your kid's birthday party and then ask them if they want to hit the pinata. And then after you get their blindfold on, replace the pinata with a beehive.